Today we're talking about grief. How do we cope with it? What do we do with it? It's inevitable in all aspects of our life. And so we're going to have a real conversation with Tom Rose. How And look at how he dealt with his grief, with the loss of his wife from cancer. Join us right now on the Britney Star Show. Your book is Balloon in a Box. So, and this is about grief. I've been, uh, I was just talking about that. I was just um, recording some about talking about grief. Um, grief is something that everybody goes through in yeah. life. Um and it's really how do we deal with it, especially when it's for it's a spouse, that's someone that you've put a lot into and spent a lot of time with. That's uh, that's very difficult. Can you can you talk to us a little bit? Like you know, did writing the book help? Was it cathartic? Did it help you through the process? Is that why you wrote the book? Okay, you're you're asking a a question here that may take us three and a half hours to explain. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, what happened was uh, my wife had breast cancer in uh, uh, 2004 and 2005, had mastectomies. Everything was great till 2017. It came back in the chest wall. Um, she passed away in August of 2019. Uh, about six or eight months after that, it was in the wintertime, it was after the holidays, I remember. A friend of mine from Florida called me, doctor friend, fraternity brother, wanted to know how I was getting along. He wanted to know if I was journaling. And I said, well, yeah, I was kind of in the, I was on the computer and I'd get up in the morning and put in how I felt. And then I put in the evening what happened during the day. And he said, well, send me your notes. And I said, well, doctor, just words and not even sentences sometimes. He just send them to me. So I sent them. He called me back about three days later and he said, you have to write a book. I said, hey, doc, you were with me in college. You know, I didn't pay attention to English class when I was in college, nor did I when I was in high school. I tell him write a book. He said, no, he said, what you've written, your raw emotions, he said, people have to hear that. People need to hear what you're doing. So I decided, okay, now it's COVID year, okay, and it's winter here, snow's blowing, it's November, um, or, or excuse me, spring, I, March, and I started in, and uh, uh, first I, I wrote a page I would take my glass of wine in the evening afterwards, sit down at eight o'clock, try to write a page. And then I decided that, you know, if you're an author, you're supposed to use big words. So I would go to thesaurus and change the words. And then I get up the next morning and look at it. So who the heck wrote this? You know, I don't understand what's that word mean. So finally, one night, seriously, one night I sat down again, I have a little glass of wine, cold night, I remember. I just started in and I thought, well, you dummy, just write it like you would explain it to someone. So I did. All of a sudden, it was three o'clock in the morning, and I had page after page. So I took that in my notes, did a book, but eh, well, I'm in the advertising market business, or was, and I thought I know people. I'll just print a couple hundred copies, give some away, and maybe sell some to pay for it, and it'll go away. Well, I kind of caught lightning in a bottle because somebody asked me to speak at a Kiwanis club, and 93 speeches later, I'm sitting here talking to you. <laughs> so I've talked to groups as small as eight and as large as 300. So wow. that's kind of my story. Um, the the balloon in a box. Someone had told me that uh, they thought grief was like a ball in a box. That ball bounces around in a box. And when it touches a side, a memory comes back or an emotion mm -hmm. touches a corner. Three or four things happen at once. It's confusing, tough to handle. I said, no, you know what? It's more like a balloon in a box because if you got a balloon on a string and you move it over here, it might stay over here. And if it's here, it might go over there. So that that's what I, I kind of I kind of took that and used that as my crutch to do things. So I, I say all my memories are in that balloon. It's with me now. It's tied to my finger. It's up here. You can't see it, but it's up there. Um, so I learned that. I guess the, I guess I should explain what happened to me. For three months after her death, I was terrible. Everything was a black and white world. I didn't care about anything. I don't, you know, I kicked God out of my life and said, you know, everybody just leave me alone, you know. Um, and one night, again, this was in November, three months, four months after she died. 
I had my dinner and uh, she and I cooked. We did a cooking thing on TV, but when we did night, five to seven o'clock at night was our time. Um, so I'm sitting there doing my dinner. I'm, I'm having a big pity party. You know, I've got this all, you know, I got Frank Sinatra on the stereo over here and I got the fireplace going and I'm sitting at the counter with my dinner and my glass of wine and, I'm really feeling sorry for myself. I mean, it could have been a movie. I mean, I get this set up. This is absolutely gorgeous set for a movie. You know, here's the guy, you know. Uh, and I, I got up, I think, to walk over to change uh, to change the record or do something. And I caught my foot on one of the stools and I fell over onto the carpet. Uh, now, I'd had a couple glasses of wine. Uh -huh. And I remember laying there thinking, my God, what she would she think of you now? Laying here on the floor, you know, but. Her favorite saying was, it is what it is, put on your big boy pants and deal with it. I must have heard that a thousand times in my life, okay? <laughs> so I hear her saying that to me. And I get up and I sit in the chair. I don't think I cried, you know, in all that time, maybe a few little tears. I'm telling you, that night it all came out. Um, so I remember going to bed. I was ringing wet. Going to bed thinking, oh, tomorrow's going to be terrible. I got up the next morning and there was color. For some reason, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to take, I was going to take grief on. I didn't know how, but I, I'm ready. Grief, bring it on. I'll give it my best. And so that's when that whole thing. I call that my epiphany. Okay, <laughs> um, so that's how the whole thing really started with the book and all that stuff. But that night. And when I decided that it's a balloon in a box and and I could move, I could move forward now take her with me, not leave her behind, um, that I should stop thinking about all the things that we didn't do because we were married for 58 years. We did a lot of things. So start thinking about those things. So that's, that's kind of how it all, how it progressed, you know, and, and, and the book then I just started writing down, you know, I wrote down what I felt and I talked about the balloon, the box. I, I, in my book, there are things by people People told me stories, still do. I hear, in fact, today I just came from a luncheon and I, I heard some new stories uh, about their grief. Everybody, you're right, everybody goes through it in a certain way. I tell everybody, I lost a spouse. I understand that. I could not understand losing a child. No way. I would not tell you I understand. Uh, and the other thing I tell people is if you've got somebody that's grieving, don't try to fix it because you can't. Don't try to change it because you can't. Just listen to them. That's what they need. That's what I needed. Just listen. I, I want to pour my heart out to you, you know. I'm hurting. Um, and in my book, I talk about things from the funeral home. You know, I, I always say to people, I'm going to help you out. I'll tell you what not to say and what to say at the funeral home. You know, you stand there and you're waiting in line to get up to the, the family. And you go, what am I going to say when I get there? He was a really nice guy. Well, maybe he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so, so I, I tell people, uh, please don't say uh, God needed her up there more than you needed her out here. <laughs> Because I go, oh my God, God's got a whole bunch of people. I just wanted one. <laughs> uh, people, uh, but the worst one is people would come and say, how are you doing? I really wanted to tell them, but I couldn't use those words. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I can't tell you. Uh, uh, I would say, oh, I'm okay. We had about 460 people go through the, <laughs> the, the visitation. I must have said that a hundred times. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> don't, don't, don't ask. Just this. I tell people, just go up and say, I love you. When you say, I love you, you say, hey, I'm here for you. All, all the things are covered there, you know, or I'm praying for you and your families. Okay. But, but I, I make people, when, I'm, when I do my presentations, the first thing I ask everybody to do is everybody say, I love you on the count of three. And everybody usually does. And I say, you know, you don't say that enough. Remember this much. You don't say you and your wife, you and your children, you, you assume, you assume your wife loves you and you love your wife and you don't have to say it. No, say it. Um, and, and so that's one of my things. I didn't say it enough, I'm sure. Um, the other thing that happened that really is probably this heart of the book is my wife was in hospice for three weeks in the hospital. 
I'm there with her, holding her hand 24-7. Well, my family would come and I'd go home and shower and check the mail and get something to eat. But if And I couldn't read, couldn't watch television. I couldn't do anything but sit there and hold her hand and think. Now, you do that for 15 hours a day for 21 days in a row. You will learn things about yourself that, hey, maybe I don't you don't like. You will question all your beliefs. Maybe not change them, but you question them. You go through them. I did that. So I think that's what that's what's in the book, okay? Saying that, you know, I may, I don't want to say totally different, but I'm pretty much a different person than I was five years ago. Hopefully a lot better. I wasn't a bad person before, but hopefully I'm a lot better now. I feel things that I didn't feel before. I feel things about other people when I talk and I see them. I, I feel that when I didn't before, I don't think. Um, I'm not as selfish as I was. Everybody's selfish to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and again, I thought about that a lot. Um, uh, you know, I'm doing these, these presentations, like I say, 92 of them now. I'm also helping facilitate uh, grief groups at retirement communities. That's and, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's, it really, uh, it's really interesting to hear these people's stories and what, you know, how they, how they're going through their grief uh, and know that I can't change it. They're going to go on this journey, but maybe I can take a few of the bumps out in the road and a few of the potholes and make it just a little smoother. If you want to understand, if you understand, you can move forward and take them with you because that's a big fear. People think if they move forward, they're going to leave them behind. Uh, I fear that all the time. Oh, I'll, I don't, you know, I want to do because I. No, you're not. Take them with you on that journey, and so that's kind of what I I do with my grief groups. I always ask them, "Are you married?" <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, your first date. I just ask people, tell me about your first date. And everybody, I get the same reaction, a little smile, a little laugh. I mean, everybody's first date's really interesting. Things that in my book, I go through my first date, which which is a three-page story. <laughs> so people now, you know, oh, I took her, took her out and I lost my billfold. She had the paper dinner, you know, <laughs> those kind of things. So uh and I ask him to tell me stories of, uh, if it's not necessarily about a spouse, tell me a, a, a funny story about your loved one. You lost your child. Tell me a funny story about your child. Bring back happy memories. It's this. This is a tough time. The holiday season is a tough time uh, for people, uh, but it's not for me now because it's a real happy time. It really is because I've got the. Once you go walk out my house, there, I've got it's all decorated. Uh, all 120 of her Santa Claus collection are up on the shelves. Um, the trees got all the all the ornaments. And when I was decorating the trees by myself, which is fine, because every one of those ornaments I put in, the, well, not a, a lot of them have a story. Oh, here's the one for our vacation year. Oh, here's the one we bought when we did this. Oh, here's my dad. Oh, here's a picture of our first dog or that, those kind of things. Those are all happy memories. So I, I probably had a little tear coming down when I did, but that's all right, you know, because I was happy, happy doing it. So I'm a happy person now, happy going around talking to people and people like you, <laughs> pretty people like you, pretty people like you. <laughs> what do you think are like the three biggest takeaways that somebody can learn from grief? <laughs> well, probably said, I probably said one of them there that, uh, you you self analyze yourself. You 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 should take a look at your, your yourself, what you believe, what you feel. Uh, also, that it's never going to end. You're always going to have some grief. You're always you know, uh, which is fine. Uh, and also, let it out. Uh, I say that uh, three things that griever needs is to find the words to say the words and know they've been heard. Um, and so my book is my opportunity to do that. I tell them when I'm speaking, it's mine. I always say to the, to the people at the end, thank you for allowing me to find the words, say the words, and look out at you and know they've been heard. Um, the other thing is, is that life changes. Yeah. 
and you need to embrace that change uh and which i think i've done i think i've embraced the, the change in my life and you know do, doing something with it with you know taking what's happened to me and and do it and making it a positive rather than a negative that's the other thing there um too much negativity if you can find a way to take that energy and that negative energy and turn it into a positive energy and move forward and use it that's and we i just did here in the theater we got 300 people i did a thing called life continues embrace the change and one of the things we're talking to basically seniors, people over 50, um, that when you get to retirement, a lot of times just retiring can be a, a grief journey. All of a sudden, you know, yeah. find things to do. You're a school teacher, volunteer to mentor somebody. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you were a carpenter, volunteer to get to the boys and girls club and teach the boys how to use a saw and a hammer and a screwdriver. Uh, and, and uh, and what we did was we had nonprofit groups out in the lobby of the theater and uh, and some profit groups, some hospice people and elder, elder lawyer and banker for the financial people could go talk to them. But we had we had several nonprofits and people actually went and volunteered. To, um, the uh, Humane Society picked up about four or five people to come help take care of dogs, you know, um, and several people like that, that these people. But they always they'd come up to me and say, you know, you know what you said. I knew, I knew, I knew. I just, I just keep saying I have to do it. I just did it, Tom. I just went and talked to someone. So, so yeah, I guess I answered your question with about, about fourteen things, didn't I? <laughs> you may have noticed. You may have noticed already, dear. Like I like to talk, so I, I ruin your show. If you think you're going to get to talk today, you're you're wrong. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> so really, what you keep busy. And just let the memories keep coming. Exactly. exactly. And then, we'll see, my wife and I were off, off television for 13 years. Just a local uh, morning show, Fox Network. And every Wednesday, we did a little cooking segment, 15, 20 minutes. And actually, we never missed an episode in 13 years. If we went away, we recorded something more. Sometimes <laughs> we, we sent stuff back. Um, we wrote two cookbooks. Uh, after she died, my son helped me finish a third cookbook, which we did in her memory. The, the first two were called, well, Cooking Together, Chinese style, Cooking Together, Quick and Easy. And we did this cookbook called Cook, Cooking Together Revisited. And that money, now we don't make a lot off of it, but that goes to breast cancer, uh, the hospital, local hospital. What we do is we... Uh, furnished little uh, boxes with hats and scarves and things for the lady and ladies in chemo that lose their hair because I know how much my wife appreciated having the scarves and all that kind of stuff. So, so we do that with the cookbooks. And then after I wrote Balloon in a Box, I got cocky and thought I was an author, so I, I wrote a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and and then uh, I didn't have a publisher. What I got a publisher for the novel, and then he found about uh, Balloon in a Box and wanted it and read it and said, I want you to do a second edition. So that's what we did. Uh, what we did with the second edition was didn't change it, but at the end of each chapter, updated it. So this is what I've learned, you know, oh, from so then to like, now. Yeah. Go out talking to people and everything. So that's where I am now. That's pretty awesome. So where are you giving these talks? Are they all... Um in homes or no 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 uh like i say the theater there was 300 people there uh kiwanis clubs uh, retirement communities uh churches uh i am now i've just been i'm on two national speaker bureaus uh hopefully i get some get some ones that really pay big money <laughs> <laughs> that'd be nice uh, yeah well you know i go i sell a few books and i, I um just had a funeral home just buy 200 books so it's like, you know they're passing them out to their people that they're, they're grieving people mm -hmm. i've got uh my next three or four uh, i'm done for the year with presentations unless something happens uh but my next one's in january i got four or five already scheduled in january and a couple of those are funeral homes and uh one's a big church uh, presentation uh one's a presentation for uh um, it's called Ryan's Place here. It's uh, for families who are grieving. 
uh, and they're having a big event. It's supposed to be 100 to 200 people there. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's great. The novels, the novels titled, titled the, the Secret is in the Pasta. And it's a murder mystery that Ooh. takes place in an Italian restaurant that first appears like it's just a simple burglary and turns into this worldwide investigation and people and stuff and, and and i wrote it in the first person uh i'm the i'm a detective uh much younger than i am the interesting thing was when when i decided to do it the story is easy i mean i knew the story was good this is what's going to happen but it's creating the characters that become a challenge and it it i've talked to a lot of authors and stuff and everybody says uh, a big piece of me is in that book. And when I read my book, then I say, yeah, that's me. You know, that's what I that's what I really wanted. That's how I wanted to be. Or, you know, uh, I, I, the guy's 40 years old, so he's 40 years younger. Um, he lost his wife. Uh, so he's going through some grief. But he lost his wife in an automobile hit and run where he can't forgive the guy that did it. So, you know. And uh, he gets a, there's a priest in it, and and uh, and, and now he's a, a a woman, you know. He's torn now. He really likes this gal, but you know he's torn between his past and his, you know. So he's going through all those emotions that uh, uh, that people go through. So and and the, and the I, so my one of my friends read it and said, "Is that gal me?" I said, "Why?" <laughs> She said, well, it kind of sounds like something I would say. I really don't know. Well, <laughs> you know that's what you do. You, you need to you need to create a lady and you create a lady. Well, she's probably got the, my my lady is probably four or five people, you know. You put different yeah. emotions with the stuff. That, that's what that's what. Um, <laughs> but, and I'm working on a I'm working on two other books now. I'm working on a sequel to my novel, which I left the end of my novel open so it could go on. Uh, and I'm writing another book like my balloon in a box for lack of a better title. Now it's, uh, it's life, love and living because it's all the stuff that I've heard from people, all the stuff that didn't go in my first book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all the emotions that I went through and it's kind of fun now. So, you know, it's a uh, love, love is a really complicated thing to start to write about. <laughs> Because, you know, we use, think of how you use the word love. You love your car, you love pizza, you love your husband, you know, you love your parents, you love your friends. So it's, it's that, it's the only word I know of that we can use that broad. It can go all the way from I love bubble gum to, you know, I'm in love with you, you know. So that's kind of fun writing. So we'll see, we'll see, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get it done. Maybe I won't, I don't know, but it keeps me busy now. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel. I have a lot of projects going on. That's what that's that was the other part of my the series that I'm creating right now. I'm in uh, is taking authors' books and and making them into you know letting people see them like that. And that was part of the thing. I'm like, I'm not gonna have time to do everything. I need to make it into a movie. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how that gives me more time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Seems fun. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's all about. See, yeah. No a strange thing happened to me and I think you'll understand it. Uh, when I did this big thing in our theater okay so it's here in my hometown where three-fourths of the audience knows me uh, three-fourths of the audience knew my wife and and I've lived in this town for um 70 years and so and the theater has been totally redone. I mean, just gorgeous. Old theater, they, they spent, I don't know how many million dollars to redo this thing. It is gorgeous. And I'm standing off in the wings of the stage. And my, my son was doing my, he does my introduction when we go places. He, and so he was doing my introduction. And I'm waiting to walk out. And I'm looking at this theater. And a couple of nights before, we had had a dinner party and we got to talking about life. You know, what is life? Blah, blah, blah. We, we have a few glasses of wine and whew, man, things go. <laughs> We're really weird sometimes. So anyway, I remembered that conversation and I'm standing there in a the theater and I'm looking around and I go, oh, 
this is where I brought my first date. You know that date when you when your mom drives you and you go to the movie and then you go to the drugstore and call mom <laughs> or dad and they come pick you up. And and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. We had this conversation the other night. We all getting carried away with what, what life is. Life is pretty simple. It's two things. It's moments in time and experiences that become memories. That's life. Now, living life is where it gets complicated. Or love is where it gets complicated. But life in itself is just, my life is experiences and memories, which I wrote in the book. Some of them, you know. So that's what life is. So, so anyway, that's the premise for doing this book. I don't know whether it'll work or not, but it, right now the outlines kind of fill it in. So it, it's looking good. Okay. That's awesome. What's the name of the novel? The novel is, the novel is, the secret is in the pasta. The secret is in the pasta. <laughs> the murder mystery like in an Italian restaurant. It's uh, a friend of the detective's brother gets killed in the in the restaurant. Is murdered in the restaurant, and it goes on from there. It's it starts out pretty simple, and by the end of the book, it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> and it's <laughs> and there's enough hanging there that there's a there's a sequel coming. Okay, that's awesome. That sounds fun. Yeah, and maybe now yeah, I've got the outline for the sequel. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I will. I don't. You know. we'll see what happens yeah but you know is it, you know i gotta get through christmas and new year's you know mm -hmm. i got i got a lot of celebrating to do for christmas and you know so that's awesome I, I'm, I'm ready for that so get through that and then i can first there i'm hoping to get i've got i've got three national ones that i've i've bid on you know so we'll see what something happens there so i get one or two of those who knows that's it. that's what happens you need you get one and then it it kind of takes off from there. Like I say, I made one speech to a Kiwanis club of 40, 50 people. And the next thing I know, I'm, you know, standing on a stage in a town about a hundred miles away, speaking to 150 people. And then I'm in a prison speaking to eight. That's a fascinating thing to do. I tell you. <laughs> it really like is. It. Well, yeah. I, I got a call from a, a young lady and she, uh, had this program in a, a prison south of here. And she said, Mr. Rose, I'd like you to come talk to my drug rehabilitation people. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Do you know who you're talking to? She said, yeah, you wrote a book on grief. I said, that's correct. She said, understand, Mr. Rose, that part, she said, a lot of these people are here were on drugs because of grief. Something pushed them over the edge. Mm -hmm. They lost a spouse. They lost a child. They lost a parent. They lost a good friend. <laughs> And something pushed him over the edge. So she said, here's what I'd like to do. She said, this program is a class program. These people have to go to school every day. That's what I do. And she said, they sign up for it and they commit. They live in the same ward all together. There were 12 guys. And she said, I want to buy 12 books. I want you to come down, speak. I want to give them the book. And then two weeks later, I want you to come back. And they were, they, their assignment will be to read the book and have questions for you. If that was in a this was in August a year ago. I went, gave my talk. I got ready to leave, and they all started to walk up towards me. I thought they're going to shake my hand. Every one of them put their arm around me and said, "I love you," because Aww. I had said, "You know, I'm do." I go out to the car. I remember it was real hot. I'm sitting in my car, got the air conditioner running, got the door. I'm sitting around, got tears coming down my face. Some lady walks by, goes, "Sir, are you okay?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, I can fly." <laughs> But then when I went back, these guys started asking their questions. And I stopped them. I said, guys, these are the most intellectual, intelligent, intelligent questions I've ever heard. What the heck are you doing in jail? And they all looked at me and said, Mr. Rose, we screwed up. You know, but we're going to make it right. We're going to do this. And the girl told me afterwards, she said, nine of them will. She said, three of them will be back here. But she said, nine of them will go out and, and make something out of their lives. So again, that, another one that really got me, I'm sitting here one night and was, I don't know, late phone rings. I answered the phone, young man. And this was a over, this was over a year ago in August. He said, Mr. Rose, I just finished your book and I wanted to thank you for writing it. And I said, well, thank you very much. He said, well, we understand. He said, I'm a senior in college. I'm heading back to school. I have a relationship with a woman. We're talking about getting married. 
And he said, I lost my dad about a year ago and my mom had your book. And, and the other night I asked her, how do I know if I'm in love? And she gave me your book and said, read this. So I guess I wrote a love story. So <laughs> he, he goes, and this last, in, in May, I got an invitation to their wedding. Unfortunately, I couldn't go. It was out in your part of the country. <laughs> That's where she was from. But uh, you know how that makes you feel in here? You know, you help some young man besides helping some elderly woman or, you know. I had a lady tell me, she came up and said, can I give you a hug? And I said, hey, listen, I take hugs from ladies all the time. Uh, <laughs> she said, well, you got me out of my dark period. When I talk about my three months. And I said, oh, I said, well, great. She said, you don't understand. I'm out of it. I said, well, yeah, I do. I said, how long has it been? She said, I lost my husband 12 years ago. You know, I'm going, my God, I, there's no way I could have been like I was for 12 years. And her friend was with her and said, she's right. She said, the first time I've seen her smile when you, I do some funny things with my thing. I, my, my old thing's uplifting. It's not a downer in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so her friend said, yeah, it's the first time I've seen her laugh or smile since her husband died. I said, that makes you feel good. Yeah. So oh, everyone, everybody tells me stories like that or comes to me afterwards or calls me and says that I makes me feel good inside because I wrote what I wrote in the book in the back of the book. It says this book really helped me if it helps one person that's a success. So from that standpoint, I, I'm happy that it's success. Okay. It's very successful then. Yeah. 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 Well, Tom, I've had such a great time meeting you. How can we find you online to or, or come see you talk? Well, uh, I, I most of my my next three are mm, here in northern Indiana. Uh, I, I have a website. It's www.thomaslrose.com. The book's there. Uh, the novel and the Bull in the Box books are both on Amazon. Um, and if somebody wants to somebody to come talk, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I do it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So that's my life now. You know, I'm here in the computer and do things and sending out mailings and following up with people. And I've got, well, I've got to actually have a speech tonight. Uh, and I have one tomorrow morning. And then I'm done until after Christmas. So, uh, so I can, I, 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 uh, went to my doctor this week ago Wednesday and uh, I'm still uh, I'm still okay so uh, at 83 I knocked on wood and so to see when I come in so <laughs> you know I it was really funny because he said uh, I want to see you back in June and I said okay I said does that mean I can plan a big party for Memorial Day he said yeah Memorial Day but he said don't plan anything for Labor Day until I see you in June so <laughs> you know so oh, thanks doc you know but listen, yeah, it's fun. It's fun talking to people like you. <laughs>